All right, hello. Hey, welcome to uh, Graphic Content. I'm Dave. I'm Jack. And uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about Dan Klaus's latest book, which came out last year, uh, Patience, uh, which is a kind of sci-fi meditation, or as the back of the book explains, it's a cosmic time warp death trip to the primordial infinite of everlasting love, um, which is a heck of a description, <laughs> very accurate. Uh, For sure. It's kind of a mind trip, uh, and it's uh, like the culmination of uh, I will a lot point of Dan Klaus' work. It is a mind trick, but it is very accessible. Yes. I read this in an hour and a half. It is a page turner. It is a barn burner, you know? A barn burner. It's a barn burner, man. And I've, we've both read a lot of Dan Klaus. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb. This is my favorite Dan Klaus book. I think it's just... I mean, he's got a lot of different stuff. Yeah, but Dan Klaus, I... Ghost World, that was the first. And uh, just the, the voice that the characters had uh, really spoke to me at the time. I probably read it in my late teens, early 20s. Uh, and their worldview, which uh, they, didn't, they saw kind of through the very commercial voice of the world. Um, and... Uh, superficiality. Exactly. Yeah, the superficiality, and uh, th that was definitely where I was at that point. And uh, I thought the characters were really, really fun and empathetic, and they were saying these like really uh, kind of cynical things about the world. Yeah. Um, and that spoke to me, and I've been hooked ever since. And then I was exposed to his other work, like um, like a Velvet Glove, Cast and Iron, which is surreal and. Uh, Almost Lynchian. Lynchian, yeah. very, um, a lot of references to film. Yeah. Um, a lot of sci-fi, nightmarish kind of imagery. Um, and so in a lot of ways, patience is um, going back to all of that. Um, going back to definitely sci-fi tropes. This is going to be full of spoilers, right? Like, spoiler alert. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> You know what? It, the, the book's been out for a year. You know. <laughs> yeah, there's not not too many spoilers at this. Yeah, at this you know, point. It's, you know, so when when patience. So describe who patience there's is. There's a big event. There's a big. Okay, I'll just say this. There's a yeah. big event that happens, and the shift in narration when it happens in Jack's tone is like like a light switch. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, that's really kind of masterful. But going back to how we got into Klaus, I would say my introduction was David Boring in the year 2000. Uh -huh. I was lucky enough in ninth grade to be invited to go see Chris Ware and Dan Klaus talk at the ICA in Boston. Oh, wow. And they had a book tour that year in which they debuted, Klaus debuted David Boring, and Ware debuted Jimmy Corgan, The Smartest Kid on Earth. The same year it won uh, like a, a huge book award. And I thought that was like a watershed. What year was this? 2000. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like wow. a watershed moment in comics where it was like, you know, the whole, it's like, look, you can't keep ignoring this. You know, like that, you know, uh, Jimmy Corrigan is just a unparalleled, amazing work of art. I think he was like in the Whitney two years later. It yeah. It was just at that moment, I felt that like that was the breaking point where it was like, you, you can no longer say this is kid stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. you know, objectively speaking, this work is really high stuff, you know. Anyway, but my sensibilities at that time went towards Klaus. I was actually a lot more interested in David, Daniel Klaus in that. And I think what it was, was you're right, I really liked in David Boring, I guess it was in ninth grade, so it was like an adult comic, you know. Yeah. So I was just like, oh wow, indie comics are so cool, I never really read anything like it before. Um, but I did relate to the uh, unreliable narrator. I liked that that was something I hadn't really been exposed to. Um, the idea that the person who's telling the story, you know, may not be, is a little morally ambiguous, um, may not be morally upright in the sense they're in their own head. Yeah. Um, but also they're just, he's hilariously oblivious. The whole world's falling apart and all I can do is pining over this girl I like met like a year ago. It's just, that's like, I think that's like, that's what that book is about, just being in your own head and yeah. completely oblivious to things falling apart around you, you know? And so with, with Patience, what we have is those, those same themes. Yeah. Um, but you have a very interesting uh, 
uh, kind of setup where Patience is married to Jack um, and they're having, a, they struggle. They're kind of lower middle class, poor, you might say. Um, but they love each other. Yeah, they love each yeah. other. It's undeniably. So. And, and just in the first 12 pages of the book, I thought, I thought the first you know, 12 pages of the book before it gets into like oh, yeah. the, main, the main thrust of the story was this you know, nice little vignette, this little poetic vignette about their lives. Um, mm -hmm. You could tell that there's just a lot of tension between them and it isn't just about money. Like it hints at certain you know, emotional undercurrents uh, that are causing stress in the relationship. And if you go to page 10 to 12, and as I was reading this, it gets a little long. And I was like, oh God, are we going there again, Dan Klaus? Like this, like, and if you look at it, you know, he's, if you look at the exact pages, it's just him walking in corridors. There's right. not even other people. They're unstimulating images. And, you know, like a music conductor, you slip the page and you go, you get the striking, semi silhouetted profile. Right. And a dead body. Yeah. And um, that image, I think, is, you know, traumatizing well but just going back really quick to yeah. like the setup before that scene like I th I thought it was really um, nicely laid out in a grid like fashion and setting it up aesthetically for something like yeah. I oh yeah I, oh, I yeah. got you know I wasn't I wasn't necessarily thinking that Klaus was gonna you know stay with these with these two characters in this way throughout the book, mm -hmm. and I saw that it was building up to something, and so yeah. it was very suspenseful. That yeah, I mean, kind of I'm, build up. I'm thinking it very musically. Yeah, you know, it's like these pages, and this beat is here to put you in a trance, so that in a crescendo, the next page shifts. Yeah, and automatically, um, the scale of the panel goes into a double spread. Right, um, and. If you change the page from that point on, the tone of everything changes drastically. He, if you know, if a Dan Klaus script was being given to Wally Wood, I mean, he would have to make the camera angles go all over the place because it's literally just people talking for the vast majority of it. Right. But he keeps it so exciting, he keeps it going because he just knows so well how to move the camera angle, so to speak. Yeah, and so you have you have the the kind of expert. Um, Ca camera placement, for lack of a better term, the composition, um, in t running in tandem with just really amazing writing. Yeah. Like the, the Jack's inner dialogue and how he's experiencing these different things. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's just, it, it, Klaus is at the top of his form. You really sense, you really get a sense of how screwed up this guy is and how uh, hurt he is. How hurt he is from the loss of his wife. Yeah. And so when the, the sci-fi element comes out, that he does have the ability to go back and change things. Um, he, t he, he, without a heart, you know, without a hesitation, he does it. Yeah, and he will. Um, um, and that kind of sets, sets the, the stage for the rest of the, the, rest of the book. Yeah, and he, he crosses all barriers to get to that. I mean, he kills dudes to get to that. Right. I mean, he, um, and he messes up a lot of people in here too. I mean, he a does. lot, of, half of them deserve it. But I'll point out, that, you know, the other half, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like he doesn't seem to really. He, I mean, he is obsessed. You know? He is obsessed. He's a little Terminator at ish. And there's a there's a hint. Well, there's more than a hint. I think that um, the actual tr time travel itself mm -hmm. is affecting his mental and physical state. Right. So, and he, lot, yeah. he, as the book progresses, you actually see more and more kind of disturbing hallucinations where he sees uh, like a glowing kind of yellow patient's form yeah. egging him on, saying, yeah, murder, murder that kid, yeah. you know, as he's getting ready to murder like his, the baby Adam in the supermarket. His yeah. costume design shifts too because he has to be a little more incognito. Yep. So he wears these like bug eye suit sunglasses. And the other time he's wearing a uh, like a Gul uh, Gilligan's Island hat, um, right? Yeah, and so can we talk a little bit about, about this double page spread? Yeah, yeah, how awesome that! Is. Absolutely. There's something Charles Burn like uh, his rendering has kind of a Charles Burns like quality to him. Um, I think maybe like Klaus and Burns at a certain point were were maybe inspiring each other oh, yeah. pretty heavily yeah, yeah. as as far as like their ink quality and and Burns definitely went really heavy into uh, into. Um, the stylistic yeah. kind of 
uh, rendering of, of form like and cloth like that. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and he's more like Kurt Swan or a Wayne Boring. He has like the cold line, the cold boring line, as they say. The cold boring line. As he puts, <laughs> it, and as he puts it in his own words. Oh, okay. You know, which I believe you see a little bit in like David Mazzucchelli's uh, Batman Year One. Yeah. Um, and you could, in which the, the author's mark making does not play into the artist's opinion of the characters. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? You, you see what I'm saying? Like, like, uh, Dan Klaus is not imposing his own opinion on any of the characters and by the way that they are depicted. Mm -hmm. um, they all look like action figures. You know, they're all kind of blank slates to a certain extent. Right. So everything's kind of morally ambiguous, ambiguous, excuse me, and plays into that unreliableness of things. Yeah. Like, he's not, he's not, he's showing, he's not telling. Right. You know, you know a, another artist would have, um, you know, maybe done something in perspective, in a forced perspective, uh, almost like a Superman maybe type of pose. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dan Klaus's figure is, is facing the, the audience um, you know, kind of almost with this backdrop of all these different uh, yeah. phantasmagorical um, yeah. doodles behind him. Um, <laughs> so there is definitely like a flatness, uh, a oh. stiffness to these characters. Yeah, yeah and then you have like uh, an interesting spread like this that pops up. Yeah, he's being really abstract. Yeah. It's kind of fun because I see him as a restrained artist and here he's really unrestraining himself. Yeah. And then, yeah, going back to the, uh, what I was saying about the, the character living largely in his head, here you see that, um, you know, in full display, <laughs> in full display, you know, the, wi the dead wife that he's obsessing over, right. all these memories that he's misremembering um, um, and, and other hallucinogenic type of, of thoughts that may be an effect of, of the time travel that he's doing. Um, you see that red figure that's on the right, you know, you, you see um, that figure. Uh, you saw that at least once, I think, previous in the book. Um, and it, it just re represents some sort of, uh, the, I, I think it represents the murderer, the unknown murderer who, yeah. who, uh, who he's seeking, um, the murderer of his wife. Um, and I just thought this page is fantastic. Uh, just, yeah. you know, there, there's, you mentioned Chris Ware. There's a Chris Ware kind of quality, yeah. the way that Ware, um, has the the a protagonist or a, a character's face, and then you have like this this storm of you know with Ware it's very it's all very orderly and uh, it's very arranged in a very Chris Ware kind of um, uh, yeah uh, quality. It's and then you have Dan Klaus and and uh, you know you could say that this is the other side of that coin. You know this is somebody who's uh, some Chris Ware kind of fixates on characters who like order. Um, and, you know, maybe uh, they don't interact, their interactions with the outside world run in counter to their ideas of order. And then, you know, Dan Klaus has characters that are similar, except there's something, you know, off about them a little more. I, and I think, hmm. uh, I, I would like to see this up against a, a Chris Ware page. If you go back to old eight balls, um, they're parodies almost of you know campy '60s comics. Yeah. And the joke and the whole setup is that there's the content is disturbing on the inside. Of mm -hmm. them. Um, and as they're really like self-aware, you know, and almost set up like gags. Like if you look at his old advertisements, like the old like joking advertisements he has, um, or uh, you know, I think he published like the life of an illustrator and you know there's a picture that's like you know looks like a 1950s car manual but it's like someone like slicing right slicing you know so yeah rest. kind of the frustrations and of somebody trying to make a career like out of like that in comics it feels like that equation in this is kind of let go a little bit and he's just accepted that that paradox that juxtaposition in his work and he's just as a result, more comfortable. Like it's like he, the joke's over, and now he's gone forward. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Well, it's, yeah, it's a lot less dualistic. Like it's a mature work. Yeah. Like you can yeah. definitely see the trajectory if you look at um, Klaus's, mm -hmm. Klaus's past work, and and you see that. Uh, and I think what he's held. He he's out to tell a really damn good story. Yeah, and I think what, um, it, it seems faster. It feels more fluent. It feels more. Um, when I look at the pieces, everything feels, you know. The, 
the, the consistency of quality is everywhere. Oh, yeah. You know, the economy of each panel is really well laid out. Um, it's not overbearing with text. I don't know. It's just, it's really, really legible. Mm. Um, anyway. And, and you get like really nice double page spreads like, yeah. like this one that we're looking at here. And uh, I believe he's in, Ooh, he wow. stepped into his own past, uh, the 1980s, 1985. Yeah. And um, he's looking out over this very familiar street scene, familiar to him because it's one from his childhood. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering what his next move is going to be. Um, and then, and then you know, you have pages like this uh, that kind of act as uh, it gives you a little bit of breathing space compared to the the more claustrophobic, gridded yeah. pages um, where where the dialogue is pushing stuff forward. Um, yeah, you're right. I didn't think of that, but you're right. If you don't mind, I would if we could change topic away from formalities and you know, I want to talk about love. Let's and, talk about love. Yeah, because like I think that. One thing I loved so much about this book is how romantic it is. You know, I'm not yeah. going to go out so far to say romance is dead, but this is just so romantic. You know, it's not, I'm not saying that things today aren't necessarily not romantic or something. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess you could look at statistics and say, like, you know, marriage is down or, like, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get into that, you know, like, but, like, there's like a something, you know, Prince Valiant about it and this like my wife was killed and I need to go back in time to stop it, you know. It's yeah. kind of like save the princess in the castle thing. Yeah, so that that, that kind of uh, gives it a mythic quality almost. Yeah. Like you're yeah. reading a fairy tale. Mhm. Mm almost, you know, like the, the, the this person has an opportunity to go back. Like the, 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 the sci-fi and the sci-fi element only be, uh, almost becomes a magical element. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the way that you remember from fairy tales. Right. Um, I mean, I was like, I'm not, yeah, I mean, it's a, like, I feel evil, like, another comparison is like the Terminator. Yeah. Know? Like, it feels like, I, I wrote in my notes, like, Patience was like if Daniel Klaus was asked to do the next screenplay for the next segment of ter the Terminator right, right. franchise. There's no robots. That, you know, but there's a lot do. of emotion. Yeah, and also just, like, hunting down. Mm -hmm. Like, he's like, it's like, a, oh, there's a little bit of a detective story in it. Like, mm -hmm. he goes back to her home and then, like, before he even goes back in time, he's like finding Andy. Who's this Andy guy? You know, right. He's like putting the pieces together. He's, you know. Yeah. And it becomes, the plot becomes about something different from what it's about because it becomes to being about being able to observe the life of someone you're intimate with before you meet them. Mm -hmm. And it gets really voyeuristic. Definitely. And there is something, I think, connection that's really interesting there between love, obsession, and voyeurism. You know, when you love someone, you look at them. And to what extent is that creepy? into what context is that creepy, you know? The way I always see it is, you know, love is when you want to serve and give and support someone else. And obsession is when that servitude gets in the way of your own health and life. Mm. I think it's about that line between love and obsession, um, which is what makes this so stimulating. It, it's almost like a cautionary tale in like, this is what happens when when you do obsess with something, you know, when you have the ability to change something, it may not go as planned. You may get answers, but you may be causing more problems in the process. Yeah, that's certainly, there's a lot of casualties along the way. That's yeah, yeah. what happens. Um, and I would say that um, one, one minor criticism of the book is that towards the end, it does get a little confusing. Just, uh, it, it gets a little confusing as the plot elements start coming together. Um, and as he's trying to thread everything together to, to make a, um, an ending that makes sense. Um, but, and it also mingled with the deteriorating mental state of the, the narrator. Um, I mean, I there mean, is I, a nice effect. I so, I mean, it. yeah, there is a nice effect. And I liked how we're spoiling left and right. <laughs> just say, like, the TV guy, and when it was the bat was revealed, I was like, oh, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. Oh, he's been here all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so characters that, that are kind of throwaway characters in the first, maybe, like, yeah. third of the book, um, you know, you see them reoccur mm -hmm. towards the end of the book. Um, overall, you know, you just, you just get a sense that um, this guy shouldn't be doing what he's doing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I, the, the paradoxes, like I said before, are kind of... The, the paradox of time travel that you see with all, all kind of sci-fi. I, I um, kind of, it's funny, like, do you like Jack in it? Like, what, what are your, like, how do you, yeah, because you're, 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 you're critical of him. I kind of, I kind of, well, I see what like you're saying. You said, he's, yeah, like, he's, morally he, ambiguous. He, but yeah. Like, he's also, like, 
like this scene right here, 57 to 58, like these scumbags need to get beaten up. Yeah, no, yeah. And I think there's something extremely romantic yeah. about how he knows he can't get involved, but he can't help but not get involved. Like he loves her so much. He must protect yeah. her. Like, he I must serve her. I don't and know if there's like he a will like bend reality and space and time itself yeah. to protect her and make this event not happen. I mean, there's something really cool about that. Yeah, but, I, I don't um, know if there's a like not like quality to to, to, to Jack, Jack because uh -huh. he is kind of playing into um, the I just find the art the artist uh, the art excuse me the uh, the the reader's fantasy of like. Uh -huh. Um, y if you do have the opportunity to see these guys that we're about to assault, um, do assault. I mean, I just and who do assault, you know, uh, yeah. your, your future wife. You know, what do you do? You know, and he is able to take action against them each uh -huh. time, um, but there are consequences to those right. actions as, as we see later in the book. Um, I just think that the bad guys are so bad in this. Yes, and I think that was like a big. He did that on purpose. Yeah, like. He's like, oh, I can't get involved, but oh my, I, ah, I got it. This guy's the worst. And like, yeah. as the reader, you're like, yeah, he's the worst, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's your, yeah, it's 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 a conundrum. And then you know, then there's that. Yeah, <laughs> and you get pretty uh, pretty awesome, like uh, it, the the pages uh, where he's rendering the. Uh, the future, like I had up a second ago. Oh, they're so funny. Yeah, they're fun. Like everything's really bulbous, um, mm -hmm. and and all, but also like keeping graphically unrendered. The the sidewalk is gray space, mm -hmm. as is the street, as is the wall. You know, so he's he's not he's not interested. It's almost like rend rendering something too much might interfere with the thrust of the story. Oh yeah. Um, so there is definitely, as as artists, we know that there's an economy to doing that. And, and the and the artist becomes morally ambiguous too, which is, you know, so, you know, if you look at like, you know, a superhero comic from like a Marvel superhero comics, it's so obvious, like, you know, the mole man's like hunched over, yeah, yeah. and the bad guy, and like yeah. the good guy's like this, you know? That doesn't happen in Dan Klaus comics. Everyone's an action figure. Yeah. Everyone's depicted in this um, kind of like democratic way. Yeah. And like, uh, and also, it's kind of an aesthetic of like um, airplane. Airplane manuals, like yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's also so kinda, when you're seeing like, like this epic tragedy, yeah. uh, sci-fi, uh, you know, uh, magnum opus, yeah. uh, drawn in that style, it, it does it it, it, I, it does have an effect on how you on how you take it in. I think also I can't imagine the story drawn in any other style. Yeah, I think also when the figures don't really represent reality slightly, like the way he's doing, it builds the concepts a little higher because mm -hmm. you're not you focus so much more on concept because you're not being drawn into the humanity of it. But then the writing is so human. It's like this, like, it throws you off guard. Yeah. It throws you yeah. off guard, you know? And that's why it's fun. And the uh, the ending, um, I'm not to give anything away, but the it, it has a very, it, it, there's a mysterious ending where it, things do come together and you see that Jack was able to make positive change, um, but it, uh, but you're not really sure about Jack's own future. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was really satisfying in that it was consistent. <laughs> We're looking at a panel of his, of his, of his, uh, <laughs> his imagining of his head exploding. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's just a fun, fun book. There's a little um, bit of grotesque humor in it. Yeah, I mean, even like, a lot of it. The campiness of yeah, this. Yeah, at the very end of the book, yes. like the campiness of a character from the back, from the, from the, the beginning yeah. of the story, you know, coming back. And, and uh, you know, it's like the way he depicts the characters. It's like they're not, it's not like mannerism, like a Renaissance painting where like their hands are, it's not like the Sistine's Chapel, like right. everything's just a rag doll. It's just an action figure. Like their heads are straight down right. in the dirt. like. Yeah, they and the action, like the action scenes, like as we as we look at that, that he he's not he's not making an action comic, so the action scenes are kind of yeah. told with the same pacing as everything else. There's segments of action in it, but yeah. you're right. I would uh, there's elements of action. I, I call yeah. It's, he's intentionally like holding back on that. Like I can only describe there, it as a cosmic time warp death trip to the <laughs> infinite of everlasting love. But what were you gonna say? <laughs> Yeah, no, like Dan Klaus is, is intentionally like uh, holding back with stuff like action, yeah. you know, which which other other writers, other artists, you know, would do like these elaborate 
splash panels maybe or that you know would just have like yeah. a lot of fun there's a lot of and lines. spend like Tons four lines, like yeah, a Rob Liefeld, four pages yeah. on like somebody going through a window or you know and and uh, Dan Klaus you know doesn't change his tone he he'll yeah. you'll see the you'll see the action and its consequence one panel after another and morally and, ambiguous <laughs> ambiguous it's a morally ambiguous action illustrator yeah um yeah yeah, patience. Any last words on patience? Yeah, I mean, um, I said Anya Davidson's Band for Life, I thought, was, I thought was the best year, book of 2016. This was a really close. <laughs> it was really close. I went with Anya Davidson, I think, because she's newer. You know, like, Dan Klaus has got a lot. Like, everyone loves yeah. Dan Klaus. But, but, I mean, man, I'm just saying this was really close. Yeah, it was. It, second, you know. Like overall, it was just a really satisfying read. It was, um, it was like yeah. a, uh, I don't know, like a theater sturgeon, no, um, you know, novelette, um, just kind of expanded onto onto uh, a different kind of scale, and and you know, just seeing like um, almost throwaway tropes of sci-fi that we yeah. grew up with, yeah. blown up, and told from a very human perspective with very human problems yeah. of, of uh, emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, uh, things that haunt the characters' pasts, uh, money worries. Grieving. Yeah, yeah grieving. Um, there's all this real, real world weight um, attributed to, to these characters that um, really make the story uh, kind of uh, among the best sci-fi writing um, I've, I've encountered in a long time. And I think also, uh, going back to tropes, this is a culmination of so many different voices of Klaus. He gets into Jack's head, and, but he can also write really great dialogue. And you know, it culminates his time probably in Hollywood writing scripts. It felt like a movie script. I read it in about an hour and a half, mm. about the time of a movie. Um, and uh, it was, it's a different kind of read from the last two books we did because the other two are very episodic, almost like new, reading newspaper comics. And this is just like one breath, mm. you know? It's just like beginning to end. It's like, I, it feels like it, almost like he wrote it in one sitting, like one epic sitting, you know? Um, yeah. All right. So check out Patience by Dan Klaus. Yeah. Highly recommended. Fantastic. Uh, we realized that uh, we've been reviewing... Uh, Fantagraphics books, so we're definitely going to take a little Fantagraphics hiatus with our next episode. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, and uh, I'm Dave, and this is Jack. Thanks for tuning in. I <laughs> keep reading. Keep reading comics, and uh, we will see you next month.